today about those conditions for us to get ready and bring Messiah. And you know where you're going to bring Messiah to? It's going to start, what's the name of the city I'm in now? Belton? It's going to start in Belton. And it's going to go to Austin. And it's going to go to Dallas and Fort Worth. And the more places that we can win for Yeshua, the faster he's going to come. And if you want to know exactly what era and which season we are in right now, it's a season of gathering. In gathering. God bringing everybody that's willing to come back to him. This is the season that we're in. People ask where are we end. There is no multiple road plans for God. God doesn't have an option one and an option two. He doesn't. He doesn't work like that. There is one option. There is one plan. And this plan has to start with the Jewish people crying out to him and say, Baruch Hava B'Shem Adonai. Okay? God does not dispense Israel. You understand that? They have to cry out. What we are seeing is an accelerated phase now. By the way, all those persecution we're talking about are part of their back because of the success of more and more Jewish people crying out and saying, we, we need to re-examine Yeshua. So this is what is happening now. But at the same time that this event is happening, another event is happening. The return of the nations. Back to Messiah, the true Jewish Messiah. Recently I was in a Christian church. And when they introduced me, they said, today we're going to learn about uh, uh, um, uh, another foreign faith called Judaism. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're going to, after the Shabbat, sell this, this video so you can listen to this particular one, to the city. And I stood up and I said, excuse me. And then they said, well, next week we'll have the Muslim imam here to learn about oh, another form. I said, excuse me, there is a little problem here. Because Yeshua was a Jew, and when he's coming back, he's coming as the greatest Jewish rabbi. Amen. So, so, so get ready. You're going to have a big surprise. Big, big, big surprise for this. But anyway. Yeah, this is aside from this. So where are we today? Where are we today? There's a scripture in the book of Acts. You, you can make a note for yourself. In the book of Acts, uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 48 and 49, it says this, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, as they uh, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Many believed. I want you to underline the word, many believe. Because we're an age people coming to understand. That there was a tragic mistake that took place 2,000 years ago. Many believe among the Jews, but here he's talking about the Gentiles. And then he says, and the word of the Lord was published throughout the region. The word therefore published in the Greek, it's the word expanded. Expanding beyond physical border. Yeshua name went from being this big to being this big. And I'm going to tell you something for Bet Filah here. Bet Filah, right? It's time for your city. I, I, I know what I'm praying for. I'm praying that no walls will be able to contain the growth that you're going to see in the name of Yeshua. You understand why? It's not a prosperity gospel. It is the name of Yeshua that is to be expanded. It's not about us. It's about Him. So there is a trans transformation that took place, and the name Yeshua is to be expansion. So our ministry is involved in this particular thing, expanding the name of Yeshua beyond one physical, physical border. It was amazing when we were in South America this, uh, this past year to see so many of the nations, not just the Jewish people, the nations were coming forward and said, we want to hold on to the tzitzit, to the to the city of a Jew, and we won't stand. We had a revival with about 100 pastors there. It's incredible. This is the season of what is happening. And we need to understand one thing. God has a plan. You heard about the term, the man with the plan? Our plan is not very good. <laughs> but God has a master plan. Do you understand that? There is a master plan, and you might not see the master plan come to fruition in our lifetime. Right. 
But God needs somebody to become the enabler of the plan. You know baseball? Right? You know the game baseball? It's pretty big probably here, yeah? I don't like baseball. <laughs> but in baseball, I learned. I have a guest from Israel. What they want to do? They wanted to go to see the Rangers and to eat Hippo National Hot Dog. <laughs> so we took them to the game. We sit there for about three and a half hours. Nothing happened in this thing. <laughs> Just eating hot dog after hot dog, hot dog after hot dog. And that was the old, probably the only enjoyable day. But then something happened. We finally get to the ninth inning. <laughs> Thanks, God. But my guests from Israel are loving the thing. And then the guy got tired, the pitcher. I learned all the lingo. I actually hired a consultant. <laughs> I had to bring David Wilson with me, a, a friend, to explain to us the rule as we watch, because we had no idea about this thing. And, and, and then he explained to me, oh, what's this? Is the guy's getting tired, so they're going to bring now a closer. He's going to close the deal. That's the best job. He do two pitches and go home and get paid the same. I want this job. Forget all the guy that sweat for eight or nine rounds. I just want the job to do a few pitches and go home. That's my job. And he is the closer, right? He is the closer. What is job? Just to close the game. God is looking today for closers. And I believe we are in an age and generation that God is bringing together Jew and Gentile like people who are going to close the deal for the return of Mashiach. Yes? This, this is, I'm telling you, and this plan is, is a plan of restoration. And what is this plan of restoration going to look like? There are two conditions. I want you to, 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 to write them down because it's all going to tie to the Torah portion. This is a very important Torah portion, this Shabbat. But there are two conditions. Condition number one, Yeshua says, Oh, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, how I long to gather you, but you were unwilling. I wanted to gather you like a hand that gathered her chick. You will not see me, Yerushalayim, until you say, Baruch Abba Peshem Adonai. Condition number one that have to occur, the Jewish people have to accept Yeshua. Here are some numbers. The last 40 years, more Jewish people accepted Yeshua than the 1960 years before that. That is a number. You need to understand that it is the sign of the time we live in. When I was in Israel growing up, I didn't even know what were Messianic Jews. There were very few. You can count them on a hand raised in Israel. Today there are between, say, say between 20 to 30,000. What do you think those 20 and 30,000 will grow up to be? The next lawyers, the next govern, government official, maybe the next prime, prime ministers. Amen. We need to believe it's a revival. That's right. I, I believe that Messianic Judaism is probably one of the fastest growing sects within Judaism today, if not the fastest one. Yes. So this is condition one. In the, the book of Romans 11, Paul equated equated the Jewish people, Romans 11, 16, to the first fruit, or what we call in Hebrew, Truma. The Jewish people said, when the Truma come back, all of Israel will be, will be saved. Okay, so when there's a portion of Israel that come back, all of Israel will be restored. All the Jew, you know, uh, the Jewish people will be restored. But, God have planned for the entire world, not just for the Jewish people. In Romans 11, he said that it's also have to meet another condition. The full, the, 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 the basically the fullness of the Gentiles have to be met. What is fullness of the Gentiles is all about? What is this term? It doesn't mean that they're full of themselves. That doesn't mean that. The term the fullness of the Gentiles actually used in another place in the scriptures. Anybody know where it's at? It's, it's in Genesis, you're right. It's in the Torah. And the word fullness, or in Hebrew, melo, M-E-L-O, melo, literally means fullness of their understanding. Do you understand? The church had the, 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 the Jesus and the salvation part right for, for, for a long, long time. But they missed the fullness of the context. And the fullness of it, part of it, comes through the Torah. 
No, if I hand you the book and I said to you, read the book, you'll get the gist of the book. But if you miss the first hundred pages of the book, then you know you're going to miss something in the story that is the foundation. Now let me say this again. Gentiles do not, now listen carefully. This might offend somebody in the room, but listen carefully now. Gentiles do not, when, when I say it, let me explain to you what I mean by this. Do not need to come back to Torah as much as they need to come back to the Jewish Yeshua. Okay, let me explain what I mean by this. The Torah is a tool to see Yeshua. Okay, it's a vehicle to get you from, from, from to see Yeshua. The Torah is not the final goal, though. The final goal is the living Torah. And the living Torah is Yeshua. Now, do you want to ask yourself a question if I Torah observant or not? The question is really should not be for we're Torah observant or not. That's not the right question to ask. The right question to us are we are Messiah centered enough? You see, if, if you're a Messiah center, you would live a Torah observant life. But a lot of people live a Torah observant life, then they're not Messiah centered at all. Matter of fact, they end up losing Messiah. And why would you want to go back to kindergarten when you were wearing diapers when you would want to go to, to first or second grade? Because most of you nation, from the nations, I want to give you this. I've been ministering for a lot of time, for a long time. Do not fall in love with the Torah. Fall in love with the giver of the Torah. Yes, yes amen. And you understand what I'm saying. I'm all for Torah. But let's make sure Yeshua is in the middle of the Torah. Amen. So there is a restoration, an element of restoration that needs to occur also among the nations. And I want to tell you something. God is doing amazing things. Amazing things among the nations right now. Coming back to the full context of Yeshua. Now, the problem is a lot of people look at those two, this equation of those two events and say, no, first the age of the church needs to stop, and then Israel will rise up. But that is not what the scripture says. Those two events are actually going to happen in parallel. The more of the nations that are coming back, the more that the Jewish people are going to come back. Because guess who's going to provoke them to jealousy? It is not going to be the Jewish people, sad, sad news, because they look at people like me and they say, you are an enemy. But they look at you and say, you choose? And I'm thinking to myself, if I wasn't Jewish, it would be crazy to give every Shabbat up. Instead of going to the lake right now, or I saw those guys in the lake with their boat. Uh, you know, baseball? Oh, no, no, I wouldn't do that. You see, that's where you, where, where, that's where you lost me there. Almost you had me. No, that was a good one. Or to go into, I saw a beautiful um, farm, farm, riding horses, doing something fun. You ready to come on a Shabbat? That's crazy. If I wasn't raising this all my life, it would be very strange. But the fact that God imparted on you to come and observe the Shabbat and live as Jews, yeah, it's to me it's something I cannot really comprehend in my mind, to be honest. But that's your ammunition, and that is your testimony to the world. It's amazing, because it's not something you would want to do in your own flesh. It's something that there's something bigger, bigger than, 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 than you is doing. Now, everything, there is a very important principle, kin, what I call kingdom of God principle. So where are we at now? Just if, to give you a continuum, why this is so important in this message today. We are in the end of the end of the end of God preparing and gathering. Everybody say, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, like that. He's doing that. Because God loved the world so much that, that he doesn't want anybody to perish. Not the Muslims, not, the, not even the Muslims. I'm telling you the truth. Nobody. God wants to bring everybody back to him. Now, in the kingdom of God, this is an important principle. Not just to the kingdom of God for your life today. Are you ready? This is a very important principle. Let me ask you a question. When God created heaven and earth, what did he do? Did he create everything in one day? How many days he took? He 
took six days. Why didn't he snap his, could he snap his finger or just spoke the word and make everything in one day and be done with this? Why did he took the time to do it? Because there is an important principle actually, everything in the kingdom, if we are to be kingdom based, and also our life today, Torah based, Messiah based, everything has to do with a process, with layers. Think about onion. You're peeling the onion, right? And it becomes stronger and stronger the smell as you're peeling kind of the onion. The same is true about the kingdom, of us building the kingdom, about you building your congregation, about your life, life with the Lord. It is a process. It is not am I saved, yes or no. It's not am I in the kingdom, yes or no. But you know, even in the kingdom, I'm going to shock you. Look at Revelation. Look at Yeshua's word in Matthew 5. He said, if you do not observe the Torah, he didn't say you're not going to be in the kingdom. He said you're going to be called the least in the kingdom. There's a big difference. You see, even in heaven, it's not am I in, yes or no, do I put my quarter in? No, that is nonsense. Even in, the, in, in Gan Eden, it's going to be levels. There's going to be rankings. Okay? This Torah portion deals with the steps. This is why this is such an important Torah. It's dealing with the steps we have to do to bring Yeshua back to earth now. These steps, you know, like when, how many of you like to barbecue? Like, like, not pig, kosher. Yes? Yes, yes, brother? C come up here. I'm going to use you. So you are like a serious barbecuer, yes? Well, I'll try, so no, 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 trying. Because I'm coming over to meal tonight. Oh, it's go uh, oh no, now he's not. Okay, what's your name? Joseph. Joseph, okay. Joseph, tell me, what do you like to barbecue? Like the barbecue uh, steaks. Okay, let's stay there because it's, it's fit my palate very okay. good. Okay. <laughs> now, Joseph, when you barbecue a steak, tell me what the steps you, t what, what do you do? I like the marinated. Well, tell, oh, yeah, well, well, do you sing to the meat? I don't think no, no, you don't say, oh, you didn't get to this level yet. Okay, that's okay. We'll forgive you for that. But that's okay. Let's talk about the marriage. So you get the steak. It's yep. frozen. What's the first thing you do? Yeah, I let it thaw out a little bit. You let it thaw out. Okay, what then? Uh, put it in the bag so I can marinate, let it sit for a little while. Okay, what kind of marination? Uh, I get the little hind sauce. Nothing, nothing, nothing fancy. I'm ready to go to Onig. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you let it marinate for a while, and then what do you do? Like I get the grill ready, start Put in charcoal, get charcoal ready. And you don't just take the steak, right? Yeah. And you just take it frozen and slap it on the grill. No, you can't do that. You can't do it. <laughs> Why can't you do that? Well, you could, but it'd mess it all up. What do you mean by messing it all up? It'd be all burnt on the outside and raw on the inside. Yeah, and so will not you, have you much flavor. It, no. All right, no. give him my hand. He know how to make his meat. <laughs> You see, you, you, you're absolutely right. When you make a piece of meat, you want it to taste. You, have to, you know what I do? I sink to the meat. I season it. Then I put the kosher salt. Then I let it rest. Then I sink some more to the meat. Then I put some kosher salt. And then I pray over this thing and uh, that it's turned good, you know. And, 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 and then I put the charcoals. And then I like to put a little mosquito wood, you know. You know, it sounds good, no? Because it is a process. If I just take the piece of meat and just put it on the meat, it will taste just like a piece of meat. It wouldn't pay, taste all that great. The Torah, the Shabbat, deals with the issue of process. So there are two applications I want you to take from this. Application number one for your life. Everybody in this room is in a different place as far as your process. Do you understand that? Different people are in different places. And we are not to judge people on base of where they are. This is important. Some of you even have a family and friends here that are in the church. And I know maybe some relationships can be very hard because of that, because they don't understand the Messianic. They don't understand what the Shabbat. Well, guess what? Let it be. Let it be. Ask yourself a question. Do they come, are they growing in God? Or they're not. If they're growing in God, then guess what? They're in a different place than you. But they're progressing. Right. You're progressing. Everybody progressing. Baruch Hashem. Right. 
The problem that we are doing a lot of time is we're trying to say we all have to be in the same place and we don't have to be in the same, the, 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 the same place. We absolutely do not. So one thing I want you to, to take and meditate this Shabbat upon is the question, where am I? And really the question, am I progressing? The question you have to ask is, am I, we all say I'm a work in progress. We all are work in progress. But am I progressing toward, toward a better relationship with Hashem? Or not and then the second question this is a bigger question because it's not only about us God has given a condition to the messianic movement through Torah what is going to take to bring Mashiach I'm going to use a great mystery and secret in the Torah today speak specifically of, of Messiah to show you that there is a global principle that's why I call it a, uh, um, I call it a a kingdom principle about bringing the Mashiach. And if you will be here in the yeshiva in this afternoon, we will expand on this idea. Okay? So let us look for a moment at this principle. And everybody knows the story of Korach, right? Rebellion. I don't want to talk about rebellion today. Just don't do it. God put... <laughs> Just don't do it. Because God will smite you if you do it. God put whoever he put in charge, and you need to submit to your leaders. That's it. I don't have anything else to add about this today. I mean, I do, but it's a different message, okay? But I want you to see what is happening. There was a very interesting thing that is happening in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, the 17th chapter, right? It says, it says basically, there's a discussion, you know, between Korach and, um, and Aaron, and we have this issue of the rod, right? And it says uh, in verse, uh, I will read it to you, but if, if you want to go to number 17, verse 20, you can go there too. And it says this, And it shall come to pass that the man I shall choose, his rod, shall bud. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings, of the children of Israel, which they murmur against you. Now let's look at verse 21. And it says, And Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and all the princes, all the princes gave him rods, from each prince one, according to the father's house, even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among the rods. And Moses laid up the rods, before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. And then listen to the next verse. This is the verse I want you to pay close attention to, verse 23. And he said, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses went into the tent of testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and put forth buds, and bloom blossom, so the, the tree start to develop a blossom. Can you imagine another tree? The rod, a rod start to blossom with, with flower. And ripe almonds. Anybody deal, anybody find this entire thing just a bit odd? Putting a, a rod down, having flower budding, and then almonds come out of this? Very strange, no? In these verses, we see one of the greatest, greatest uh, principle, kingdom principles that I would like to address with you today. This Torah portion actually deals with this idea of chosenness. chosenness. And, and let's look specifically for a moment on verse 23 as we, we learn something about the return of the Messiah, actually. I want to make a connection between the Messianic, what I call, we call the Messianic age, the time Messiah, Messiah return to this verse. Now, the Jewish commentator, the French Jewish commentator by the name of Rashi, how many of you have heard about Rashi? He's, he was French, one of the famous Jewish commentators, explained to us something very important. You notice that the flowers came out of the of the of the of the rod he explained that a flowers coming 
right before fruit have to occur. Okay? There is a, a very important principle here as well. Flower, blossoming is occurring before there is fruitfulness. Okay? And then there's a second thing. And here's what Rashi say. And I quote, Rashi, there, there was a commentary that written on the entire book of Numbers, called Numbers Rabbi. It's go back to the first century. It's a full commentary of the book of Numbers. And they asked the question, and Rashi quotes this. He said, why did they produce almonds? Why did this rod produce almonds? Why didn't it produce pomegranates? Would make more sense, right? The pomegranates of our own, you know? Or nuts. And then he explained, he said, Israel is likened, is likened to almond as it is speaking about the future blossoming of Israel as a nation. It's speaking about the future blossoming of Israel as a na nation. And then it's going to continue on shockingly. And it's making this point, this sermon, and it says, the same rod that was in the end of the king was the same rod that's the rod of Aaron was at the end of the kings until the destruction of the second temple and then it became hidden listen to this amazing commentary it became hidden this is now now it's becoming really interesting and you see the principle the kingdom principle here in a second it says this is the same rod that King Messiah, the Mashiach, will hold in his hands. As it is written, the rod of thy strength the Lord will send out of Zion. Rule thou the midst of thy enemies. That's actually from Psalm 110. In essence, the sages understood in the Torah portion, that it's really, it's, it's have to deal with the condition, for the condition of the blossoming of the Mashiach himself. What is the blossoming and, and the return? It's talking about the return of the Mashiach. This is what the Torah is really about. This, the rod, or the handle of the rod, is a picture in Judaism, it's represents the Mashiach himself. The blossoming, the return, or the coming of the Mashiach. And in order for this to happen, specific conditions have, uh, have to be met. You will see why it's an almond tree in a second. It will give you the, the answer. It's amazing. Now, like I explained to you to before, a specific condition have to be met. I have in my house a bare spot. There is no grass in it. One night I stayed up till 3 a.m. in the morning, you know, 2 a.m. There is infomercials. You know those infomercial, all those amazing products you can buy. See, some stay up till 2 a.m. in the morning, and you can buy it. And if you call in this second, you're going to get like amazing deal. So I stayed up, and they said we have those seeds. You put in the ground, you're going to grow. You're going to grow grass on concrete even. <laughs> so this is too good to be true. I'm calling. Stayed up 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm calling. Send me four bags. I'm so happy. I'm getting my bags. I lay them all flat. Lo and behold, a week later, I have beautiful grass. Green, lush. The area was bare. And I said, it's a miracle. I'm going to become a national spokesman for this product. <laughs> there was a little problem, though. A week later, I come back. The old thing is dead and brown. Goner, I want a refund. They say, oh, yeah, there's one catch. You have to water this grass four times a day in order to survive. You see, a condition had to be met for this to survive. The same is true about Mashiach. There is, in order for this blossoming to occur, yes, by the way, in order for this blossoming and for the fruit to come, right? First there was a blossoming. And then there was a fruit, the, the almonds themselves. In order for this to occur, guess what has to happen? A condition has to be met. And the Torah gives us the condition for the return of the Mashiach right here. The blossoming, the, the rabbis teach that this blossoming of the road, it's talking about the coming of the Mashiach.
okay? And I want to talk to you about this condition today. By the way, there's a, also another awesome principle here for your life. So many times we want to see fruit in our life, right? We want to see people touch and, and restored and through our work. Amen? That's called fruitfulness. What is the first commandment in the Bible? Right. What Yeshua gave us in, in the book of Yohanan, John 15. He said, make a fruit. But Yeshua took it a step further and said, make a fruit that what? Will do what? What? That will last. What is this difference? You see, in the case of the miracle, guys, there was, a fruit, there was a, uh, a fruit, but it wasn't lasting. But what will happen 100 years from now matters. You, you want to know if something is fruitful or not? What will happen down the road? That's what really matters, not what's happened right this moment. So you need to think as a congregation about your little kids because we will not be here forever. There will go and be another generation and another generation and another generation. Whatever we do at Bet Filah, whatever we do in any Messianic congregation, need to be something lasting and not something temporary. Because God is not a temporary God. But the point of the matter, that so many times we want to produce fruit, but we don't want to go through the blossoming. We want to somehow skip through this process. The process of blossoming, you know, this is, this is what the Torah deal with. How do you go from blossoming to full-pledged fruit in your life? And ultimately, the ultimate fruit for the world will be when Yeshua come back. That will be the ultimate gift to the world, to the Jewish people. Matter of fact, the word there, if you remember, just to give you an... an uh, so, so I want you to think about this principle for a moment. There is no shortcut into the kingdom. You remember everything is levels and layers. You cannot just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be fruitful today. It's not work like that. You have to do the time if you want to commit, the, not the crime, the good work. You know? You understand what I'm saying, yes? Matter of fact, this idea of the rod representing the Mashiach you're going to see this afternoon in the yeshiva quite a lot. For instance, remember the, 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 the rod, the same rod that, that turned, that, that is a picture of the Mashiach. Remember what happened. <coughs> what happened with this rod? Aaron took the rod and cast it down. And what did the rod turn to? Snake. Snake. Anybody know what the word snake in Hebrew is? Nachash. <laughs> Nachash. Do you know that the word Nachash and the word Mashiach in Hebrew have the exact same value? 358. Close. 358. A Nachash in Hebrew is a Mashiach. In the book of John, chapter 3, Yeshua says that just as the, the serpent was, was lifted up, so the Son of Man is to be lifted up. Remember Bamidbar, it's, uh, it's coming up. Who was the, 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 the Jewish people looked at in the desert when they were healed instantly? It was the Nachash, but the Nachash is the Mashiach, and the Mashiach is the, the representative of the rod. In essence, Yeshua was there. He was there during Mount Sinai. He was there throughout all, all time. He was there. Messiah was there. You guys following this? It's a little promo for the afternoon Yeshiva. <laughs> So, what is this prime condition for the ultimate fruitfulness? The return of our Mashiach. The answer found in the almond tree. And now you understand why almond. The word in Hebrew for the almond tree, and the reason that almond tree was produced and not a pomegranate tree, is come to the word shaked. Shaked, it's a S H A K E D. Shaked. Shaked is the word for almond tree, for almond, okay? <coughs> What's the word shaked come? Do you understand that in Hebrew language, it's a very dynamic language? And every word 
made out of three root letters. So anybody knows? Anybody study Hebrew here? A little bit? A little bit? Okay. So the word shaked, the tree, the almond tree, is actually rooted in the, in the letter shin kuf dalet. Shin kuf dalet. And it has a great meaning that will explain to us. You see, that's the problem in reading the Bible in English. You're missing, you're missing the gist of it. But the word shaked, or, or the process of we call shkida, it's a process, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a process. It's mean, and I give you a, a definition from Evan Shoshan Dictionary, to go through something from a point A to point B, okay? It's a process. Again, you see, it's a process. To go through something with great labor. To go through something with great pain. It's to do something with great diligence. To do something, what's the, 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 the opposite of care, being careless? To be with great care. So the word shkida is to go through something with those attributes. attributes. Think about a woman who gives birth. She goes through a lot of labor. It's painful. In essence, what the Bible says is that the reason that it's given us an almond tree. Remember, this is from going from blossoming to full-fledged fruit. So, you know what I'm saying? We have to go through a process that called shkida, shaked. From that's that's from the word almond. What is this? The almond tree. Yeah, yeah. But this is this is only part of it. Shaked, right? Shaked. Oh, thank you for putting it. Shaked is the almond, but. The root, shin, shin kuf dalet, has to do with the kingdom principle of Torah that will bring Mashiach. The process of Shkida is what going to bring Yeshua back to earth. And that's why it's giving us a Shaket tree. And matter of fact, Yeshua had to say a lot about Shkida. Yeshua himself had to say a lot about being, being a Shaked. Shoked. He says in Luke 21, 36, six, he says, Watch you then in every season, praying that you, you may be accounted worthy to escape all the things that are about to come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. The word there for watch is the word shaked. Here is a kingdom principle in Romans 12, 11. He said, be shoked. Or here's the way the translator put it. Be in great diligence and not slothful. In the spirit fervent, the Lord serving. The word in Greek for the word shkida is the word spude. Spude, which literally means in haste. In great lever, labor. In earnestness. In diligence. Interest one self most earnestly. The process, what the Torah teaches us, stay with me for a moment. The process of Shkida is the process that will complete the blossoming. And why do we want the process of, co of completion of the blossoming? Because the Torah teaches us only when the blossoming complete. The fruit, the, the, the flower fall, and only then the fruit is ready. Only then Yeshua is ready. And the ultimate fruit is the return of the Messiah. I want to tell you something. We are, with all my heart, I believe this today. We are in the season of labor. Great labor. Painful labor. It is going to cost you something to make the name of Yeshua known into the world. But here is, the, here is what this story is about. Are you ready now? This is big. This story portion deals with the issue of chosenness. Who got chosen? And let me ask you a question. Was Korach, was he one of, would you say, we, was he one of the elite guys? Look at his lineage. What about the 250 men? Were they, would you say, are part of the elite upper echelon? 
They said they were the Nisiei. They were the leaders of the leaders, the cream of the crop. They were the best. What happened to them? What happened to them? They were destroyed. And the reason that they did destroy, they wanted to find a shortcut. You realize when they said we all can hear from God, their motivation was not right. Their motivation was not pure. They wanted to find a shortcut to impart their own agenda. But God has an agenda. And he says whoever willing to go through the process of Shkidah, the reason that Aaron, Aaron wrote Blossom is he was willing to go through this. He understood there was no shortcut. Remember, here Aaron stood up in his inauguration, and his two children, Aviyah and Nadav, turned to a barbecue. No pun intended. We're talking about again barbecue. But you remember, it says, and Aaron held his peace. Right? That's not what they said, though, the scripture said. It says, and Aaron bled. That's what Vayadom Aaron. It's literally saying in Hebrew that is inside, he was bleeding. There was no shortcut. The issue here is Shkida. In Shkida and being Messiah follower and being a Torah follower, no matter what the world said to you, there is no shortcut. There is no shortcut. And if we are not going to take the shortcut, I promise you something, God is going to bring us to the best, straight, straight and fastest way. He will do that for you. That's called grace. That's called mercy. But there is no grace when there is no truth either. That's what my Bible tells me. So I want to talk to you today about these conditions again. No, I'm just about wrapping. What will bring Yeshua back is people like you in Belton, Texas, ordinary folks, stand up and really make a commitment. Not just to meet on a Shabbat but to live for Yeshua, to live to your strangers and those in the Catholic Church and those in the Baptist and those who are lost and the homeless and the poor, to do those things in the name of Yeshua. That is what going to make your rod blossom and Yeshua radiate in your life. But showing up here on a Shabbat one day a week is not going to do anything. I'm going to tell you the truth. It's a choice you have to make. The choice you're going to have to make to be a light to the Jewish, Jewish community or not. As little or few as you have in your place here, but I'm sure there are some Jews. Listen to the hand of the Haftarah in Isaiah 66, this Shabbat. It says, "For uh, this is coming now, you don't even have to read the gospel. This is God's master plan. Here is the gospel. And it says, for I know their works and their thoughts. The time come. And listen, the time come for what? I, God said, will gather all the nations and, and tongues. And they shall come, and they shall see my glory. You have to understand something. I'm talking to you now from, from my heart on this matter. You don't need to become Jewish. Because there's nothing. You know, God chose the Jewish people. But he chosen them. He's coming back to the issue of chosen. He chose them to what? For his glory. And sometimes as Jews, we confuse it with our own glory. It is not our glory. It is God's glory. My glory. And he said, I will work a sign among them. By the way, who we will gather? He will gather the nations. You see, again, God's plan for, for, for chosenness is not just for the Jewish people. God chose the entire world. You're talking about a big God. He chose everybody. But he have a way he's going to execute this plan. And he said, I will put work, assign among them. Among who? Who is he talking about? No. 
He will put the sign, and more, li listen, I will, he will put the sign upon the Jewish people. And I will send such escape to them, unto the nations. They're going to go to the nation. You want to know who's going to be the greatest missionary? It's going to be the Jewish people. And God did not replace the Jewish people, or I'm following the wrong God. They're going to go to Tarshish, to all Lord, and the draw the bow, to Tubal, and to Yavan. Yavan is Greece, you know, it's talking Greece, is a picture of the nations. It's a picture of the, the, the non-Jewish world. To their isles afar off, that have not heard my name. Neither have, have they seen my glory. And they, they shall declare my glory. To who? Among the nations. You are from the nations, most of you. I am here today. Do you realize we are fulfilling a prophecy here today? In the house of God? No, I don't think you understand. Let me say it again. We are fulfilling a prophetic word of God in this Shabbat, June the 8th. I'm telling you, we don't have to study prophecy. We can be part of prophecy coming to life. You don't seem that you understand it. We are not just to read the book. We are a part of the book. We are part. We are in it. You and I are in the book. This is exciting, no? So who is it going on? So, so look. Let's, vi let's con conclude this. There's a few more verses. And then they say, And they shall bring all your brethren out of all the nations for the offer offering unto the Lord upon horses and upon chariots and upon leaders and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain. Yes. This is Sukkot. You know, go to Zechariah 14. This is when everybody going to gather in Sukkot. Swift beast, to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, said the Lord, as the children of Israel bring their offering to the clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And of them, this is also shocking to understand. And of them, who are the dam here? It is not Israel. Israel is not the dam. The gum mayhem. I'm dealing now with the principle of chosenness. Now it's going to be sound almost anti-Semitic what I'm about to say. But it's not anti-Semitic. It's what the Bible says. And of them also will I take the Kohanim and the Levim, says the Lord. How can a Kohen and a Levi be from the Gentiles? How can it be? Because God said that the job of the Jewish people is to bring the nations in through the front door to have the same relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're not second class at all. You have a potential to inherit the promises of the Jewish people. You're not replacing them. You're joining into them. Amen. Look at the promise that is given unto you. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, what a promise is by our God, shall remain before me, said the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. He's talking to his people again. What a promise. Don't go against the Jews. And then it says what's going to happen in this day. Today, it's funny, we're reading it. It's Rosh Chodesh, starting to now. And it shall come to pass. That from one new moon to another, Rosh Chodesh, and from one Shabbat to, a Ch uh, Shabbat to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. Amen. Shabbat will be observed even by the Baptist when he's Kitan. <laughs> I don't mean it. You, know, you don't understand what I'm saying. Be no theological discussion. We are seeing one of the greatest promise of the gospel here in Isaiah. Now, what is the conditions that have to be met in order for this to happen? You know, we learn about condition a little bit in the Torah portion, but this 
deal with also condition. You're going to have to have Jewish people who go to the nations and bring the, 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 the message of the, the full message of the gospel to the nations. That's why I call this message today to the Gentile first, to the Goy first. You realize that the calling of the Jewish people, the greatest calling of the Jewish people is to be all a goim, a light to the world. A light to the nations, to teach them about the fullness of Mashiach, to teach them about the beauty of Torah, to teach them that is the greatest calling for the Jewish people. And why he gave us this calling? He says, for my glory. So you have to understand, that is the calling of the Jewish people. That is, when, when he said, what did, when Paul said, what advantage the Jews have in saying many ways? He's talking about advantage to bring the message to the Gentile. But here is the problem. Where do you think the Gentiles going to hear the message? If it's not, where do you think the Jews going to hear the message? It's going to be from the Gentiles. It is a chicken and the egg. Both parts need each other in this body. The Jewish people need the nation. You have a responsibility to teach support Jewish evangelism. If not in your city, then internet. That is your job. That is your duty. That is your responsibility. The church, that is the responsibility to do that. But here's the thing. How are you to do it? Now you know what is it that you are to do? Then the second question is how, how are you to do it? And we learn how you are to do it with a process we call shkida, with great pain, with great labor, with great sacrifice. And by the way, if you choose to go through this, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to become the priest and the levim because you went first in line to stood, stand before the Jewish people to bless them. When you do that, you will inherit those promises to the fullest. Amen.